folks, welcome back to the Hickory Hacker Workshop. I'm in the museum portion of the workshop right now. This is another Workshop Wednesday video. This is actually the last one before Christmas 2021. So happy holidays to everyone. Uh, I'll be back in two weeks after this one, uh, right before New Year's. Um, but uh, with the spirit of Christmas in mind, I uh, thought I would share a couple things with you before we get going this week. Uh, first off, um, you all know if you've watched my course vlogs that I've got a partnership with Stuart and Jacoby uh, that started back this last summer and uh, it's been going great. You guys have been buying the bags from them using the promo code HickoryHacker21 and uh, actually sold out of the blue bag that uh, I use, which I'm not sure is in the screen or not, but it's back here. Uh, so thank you very much to everyone who has bought a bag or bought anything from Stuart and Jacoby. Um, Stuart and Jacoby and I are both very pleased with how the partnership has gone so far and they were very thoughtful in sending me uh, a custom gift for Christmas to show their appreciation that I just wanted to show you guys. There you see the Hickory Hacker logo in this really cool handmade leather, uh, you know, you could use that a bowl for putting your keys in, your wallet, things like that. I've got it down here in the museum and I'm going to put some balls and tees in it. Um, if I even want to cover it up because it's too cool. So uh, they also sent me a flask with the Hickory Hacker logo on it, as well as a tumbler with my initials on a leather sheath for the tumbler. So really want to thank them for everything this year. They've been very supportive of everything I've been trying to do. And uh, I'm glad that you guys have been supportive in buying things from them, which uh, they are certainly worthy. Speaking of Stuart and Jacoby and Christmas, I uh, thought I would show you a couple things if you're looking for a last minute gift idea or probably more, most likely if you want to buy something for yourself after the holidays with some cash or whatever. You might remember back in July, um, I showed you the bag that uh, I use and, and gave a thorough review of its, um, you know, of its features, things like that. And uh, since then, uh, I've also, I, I've planned on doing a similar video for uh, some of the other things that uh, they've, they've sent me over the last couple months um, that I use in every round and that you've probably seen in videos, uh, but there just wasn't an easy way to do the same kind of video I did for the bag. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to kind of showcase a couple more items from Stuart and Jacoby that you can buy off their store. Uh, and, um, you know, if, if it's too late to get it before Christmas, which it may be at this point, I apologize for not doing this sooner. But um, definitely something you can pick up for yourself after the holidays, um, and you'll see why in a second. So let's start with uh, head covers. Um, you know, head covers and hickory clubs are pretty important, in my opinion, because you're, if you're using authentic woods, uh, you definitely want to keep those from getting bag chatter and getting knocked around in your bag. So it, it's pretty essential to use a head cover. Now, you could use any head cover. You could put a sock on it if you wanted it if you wanted to, but uh, I think in the spirit of, of hickory golf and, and the traditions of, of how this stuff looked back in the day, uh, Stuart and Jacoby obviously is the go-to site for some very cool uh, new but period looking uh, head covers and accessories. So we'll start with the head covers that I use. Um, they've got different sizes that you can go with. Uh, you could even get these in a size that would fit your modern driver, uh, but the sizes below the modern driver, um, I think there's two other sizes, all of those work great with hickory clubs. So uh, I use both the, um, I believe this is probably like the three wood for a modern club and uh, the hybrid uh, head covers for my hickory woods, my brassies. Um, you know, my play, play clubs right now have one of these guys on it and then I've got this one on another bag. So. Those are cool. Um, also, I'll just point out, obviously, made in the USA, like everything at Stuart and Jacoby that they make. Uh, but it's got a nice felt um, interior so that if there is a little bit of moisture on the club when you put it back in the head cover, that dries it off really well. And uh, yeah, these have been super uh, durable the entire season, and they look great. Um, I got the blue color that's in my bag there. They've got a whole variety of colors and different tartan patterns. Uh, that I'll put a link to in this video uh, so you can see what else they have. But certainly, treat yourself. Get some of these for your head covers. Um, if the tartan pattern's not your style and you want to go with something kind of 
you know, like this. This is another thing they make. These are rather uh, new, I believe, over the, the past summer. This is their knit head, co head cover. And again, just like the, uh, the others, there's a modern size, uh, you know, driver head cover. And then the ones below that all work great with Hickory Clubs. Um, you know, they've got these two lines here, so you can kind of tell at a glance what you're looking at. But uh, there's ver varieties of these, uh, obviously different colors. So check these out. Uh, the one thing I'll point out, and I'll actually put a, po a photo or maybe a video up on top of this. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but I want to illustrate why I like these head covers so much, especially the knit ones. And let's see. We'll go with this guy here. So the thing that I hated about the Amazon purchase of head covers, like knit head covers like these that I bought a while back, uh, was that the neck was too short. So when you put these from Stuart and Jacoby on your club, you see how far that neck reaches down the shaft. That means when you put this back in your bag, you don't have to worry about it sliding off as you're walking. I mean, there's a lot of extra room there to hold it on. And I think this is the key component as to why you should buy these guys, not just the, the, because they look great, but because the neck is so much longer than the ones that I've picked up off of Amazon for cheap. Um, so yeah, that, I mean, there's not a whole lot more to say about head covers other than they do their job, they look great. And uh, this little additional extra material down here on, on the neck uh, is you know, super uh, valuable for keeping the head cover from getting lost. So uh, definitely like these, pick these up if you can. Um, let's move on to, you know, the, the, if you picked up the pencil bag, there's ample room in there for your keys, your wallet, you know, balls, all that stuff in the main pocket. But if you want to keep things a little more separated, they make a really cool accessory bag that I want to show you. The one that I have on mine is this really nice bison leather uh, accessory pouch. It's got a really good quality clip here. This has never come off my bag. Um, you know, it's, it's really tight there, so it's never going to come off. You just strap this on the primary brass ring that your uh, shoulder harness is clipped to. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's high quality item like everything else at Stuart and Jacoby. Uh, good quality YKK zipper there. Uh, the interior's got some flair. You got a little bit of a tartan pattern going on there. That might be the, uh, uh, I'm not even going to try to guess what tartan pattern that is. But, I mean, look at everything I have in here. It's COVID days, so I got an extra mask in there. I got some extra pencils, um, ball markers. Uh, you know, anyway, I put my phone, my keys. Well, I've used my phone for the filming, so I don't usually put that in here. But I put my keys and my wallet in here for sure. And uh, I've got extra room for business cards in case anybody wants one. That kind of thing. So there's plenty of space in there for all that kind of stuff, which is great. And again, it looks awesome. You could go with the leather routes, or you could go with the tartan pattern, similar to the head covers I showed you earlier. This one was actually the uh, tea gift at the Florida Hickory Open. Stuart and Jacoby donated these to everybody who participated in that event. And I was super excited when I came out to my bag on the last day, and this was clipped to it. I was like, oh, that, that, that's awesome. So again, very high quality clip here to, to get on your bag. Same zippers on the other one tartan pattern inside and you know nice logo for the Florida Hickory uh, actually yeah the Florida State Golf Association has their logo right there so that was a cool pickup um, one last thing I'll show you about head covers tartan pattern also comes in a putter head cover and uh, I didn't use a putter head cover for a long time when I started playing with hickories I just didn't think it was that necessary um, but uh, there was one round where I noticed that my putter was getting knocked around more than I wanted to, and I noticed a couple little bag chatter marks that kind of bothered me about it. So uh, this was the tea gift at the Wisconsin Hickory Open up at La Sonia, and uh, I, I picked this one because it's got the blue in it. It's a, it's a different pattern than uh, this one, obviously, different color pattern, but the same blue. So it fit my bag pretty well, and uh, this is great because it's got a magnet enclosure. Uh, or fastener, however you want to say that. Um, a lot of times you run into these with uh, Velcro, and those are fine. They'll stay on your putter really well, but they're also kind of a pain to take out every time uh, or take off the putter whenever you want to use it. So I love this one because I can slip the putter in and out of here. Let's let's uh, 
Not that you need, uh, you know, a demonstration of how to use this, but so that stays on there really tight. That's not falling off when you're walking around with your bag, and then when you need it, you just pull it out like that. So very cool looking uh, head covers. You know, look, I'm a broken record when it comes to Stuart and Jacoby, but they're high quality stuff that's made in the U.S. That right there is all you need to know, in my opinion, to, to shop there and buy stuff. There's so many uh, examples of this kind of stuff that looks like it might be cool on Amazon, but it's cheap, it's gonna fall apart on you. Um, you know, so it, it may be affordable, but you're gonna end up buying it multiple times. Uh, whereas if you pay for one of these guys, you're gonna use this the rest of your golfing life. And it's gonna look great while it's doing its job. So that's my pitch uh, for uh, last minute gift items if you need anything, uh, you know, or probably most likely something for yourself. Okay, before we go into the workshop here, I thought I'd show you a couple things. Um, and actually this is uh, related to a question that I got uh, the past week on, oh, I don't even remember where it came, might've been on an Inst or a YouTube channel, um, a video that was on one of the comments, or one of the comments on the video, sorry. So it was related to shaft straightening. And the question was, are there bends that are intentional that you'll come across? You know, the, the bend that we were fixing on the Patrick Kennedy shaft straightener board last video uh, was more of a warp than it was any kind of in, anything intentional from what I could ascertain. Uh, but on putters is, is where you're going to see some intentional bends. And you also may see this on irons as well. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. Um, but the two bends that I want to show you um, are the, the most commonly found bends, on a, intentional bends that you'll see in the shaft of a putter. And what I can tell, there's a little bit of confusion out there uh, as to what exactly is a St. Andrew's bend. If that's a term you haven't heard before, go ahead and look it up when you get a chance in Google. And you'll see examples uh, of clubs that supposedly have what they think is a St. Andrew's bend, but you're going to notice that there's not a lot of consistency with what people are saying about that bend, it's that specific bend. Um, so my understanding of what a St. Andrew's bend is comes from Pete Georgides' Collecting Antique Golf Clubs book, which I have right here. This was the first book that I bought when I got interested in hickory golf. And it's pretty much a, you know, an overview of everything you need to know about hickory golf. Um, or at least not, I shouldn't say hickory golf, about collecting antique golf clubs, many of which are hickory shafted clubs. Uh, but there's a section in here where Pete talks specifically about the difference between a St. Andrews bend and a Carnoustie bend, uh, both of which are the bends that you're going to find most frequently in a putter. So I'm just going to go ahead and read from Pete's book here. Um, and uh, then we'll talk a little bit about this in a second. All right. Occasionally, putters are found with bent shafts. At first glance, they look like any other shaft that is dried unevenly. But there are two examples of intentionally bent shafts that were used in putters for a decade either side of 1900. The St. Andrews bend had a shaft which bent into the wind, or so that the club head was to the right of the player's hands at address. The Carnoustie bend bent to the front, away from the player, and its effect was to create the feeling of a club being center shafted. It is not known precisely when these styles were first conceived and ultimately they were supplanted with bends and angles incorporated into the iron heads themselves to accommodate the same offsets. Okay, so let's start with the St. Andrews bend. Um, if you could visualize what that paragraph just said, basically you're looking at a shaft that has a bend where the head of the shaft or the head of the club is behind your hand. So your hands are to the right of the club head at address. That is a, a position that's very similar to what's known as a forward press uh, in modern golf parlance. So um, I'm going to show you an example of what I think is a St. Andrews bend. Now the, re the reason I say I think is because I think there are a couple ways that you could uh, 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 you basically uh, cause that, that bend so that the uh, head is behind your hands. This is, I think, the easiest way to do it, and I'll actually flash a photo up there in a second um, that'll demonstrate it, but this is a Huntley thumb groove putter. It's got this really interesting patented thumb groove. I think I've showed this club uh, before on my channel, um, 
But the reason why I like this club is because it actually, I think, demonstrates the St. Andrews bend. I don't know if that's going to show up at all. In fact, let me get behind the camera so I can do this right. But if you notice, if my hands are at a dress, let's try to get the club head in a spot where you can see that clearly. You see how basically my hands are left of the club head, effectively, you know, producing a forward press at a dress. This is what I think Pete's talking about when he's, when he's describing a St. Andrew's bend. Now, the confusion, I think, is that people will look at a club that's got this kind of bend in it, where basically this is creating a flatter lie angle at a dress. And my understanding is that people think this is a St. Andrew's bend, but this matches, in my opinion, the definition of a Carnoustie bend where it's basically the shaft is starting to, to bow toward the center of the, the club head to create that center shaft feeling. And I think in this instance, this club was probably bent this way to accommodate the, lie, the preferred lie angle of the player. Um, so it, it starts to bend down this way right about here. So I'm not going to belabor this too much. I You know, the thing is, I'm fine being wrong on things, you know, and, and I'll go out on a limb and say, this is what I think is, is going on, or this is what I think the situation is. Um, if somebody can show me something else that clears it up, that's really all I'm after. I just ran into this a lot when I was first collecting clubs, where somebody would describe a St. Andrew's bend, and I would see different kinds of bends defined the same way. So it was, you know interesting to me when I came across Pete's definition, which is the clearest definition I've seen so far of a St. Andrew's bend. And then to back that up, I think I've found examples of clubs with that particular bend uh, matching that description. So if I'm wrong, let me know. Let's figure it out together. Um, but I think it's imperative for us as collectors of these things to kind of get our terminology straight so that we don't confuse future generations like I feel like I was confused when I first got into this. Um, so I think with that, uh, we're going to move on to this week's projects. Uh, there's a couple things that I want to show you uh, in the workshop real quick, but the main feature today is grips and cutting grips. Um, I have probably three sets of beginner clubs, beginner sets to build right now, and I've run out of grips. So I went over to Tandy Leather. This is a great time of year to buy bulk leather from Tandy Leather, as I'm going to tell you about in a little bit. Um, but I bought several sides of leather so that I could cut new grips for the, for the clubs that I have to build over the next week or so. Um, so you're going to see how I do that process in a different part of the workshop, which basically means upstairs in the living room. And, um, and then I'm going to show you actually uh, one of those grips and install it on a club so you can see the finished product basically of what you'll watch me do upstairs. Uh, I also want to give you an update on where I'm at with the, um, uh, the project of lengthening a shaft with a splice um, extension. Uh, I, I made some good headway over the last weekend, uh, re reconfiguring my workshop a little bit to accommodate the jig that I needed to make for that project. And uh, I just wanted to give you a quick glimpse of where I'm at with that because uh, I'm excited to say in two weeks, the next Workshop Wednesday video that's going to be the featured project is uh, lengthening a shaft with a splice extension. So we've um, got that to look forward to. All right, well, I think that's enough of me talking. Um, let's get into the rest of this video. All right, we're upstairs at Hickory Hacker headquarters. I needed some floor space to work with the leather. Uh, and what you see in front of you are some sides of leather from Tandy Leather. It's where I buy my bulk leather, and um, you know this is the time of year to buy bulk leather. We're in the holidays uh, time frame, and uh, Black Friday sales are pretty good at Tandy Leather. So I picked up several sides of three to four ounce leather. Uh, that's what I find to be the best for golf grips, and I've also got some suede there that's probably two and a half to three ounce, um, and we'll get into all those specifics here in a little bit. Um, and I also tell you uh, what I've got in mind for these um, particular grips because there's different kinds of leather in front of you here and also some off to the side that I haven't shown you yet. And I've got some specific purposes in mind 
for what I'm gonna do with these grips. Um, uh, the biggest reason I buy bulk leather and not just buy individual grips, which they sell at Hickory Golf Workshop, um, is because I go through a lot of grips. I'm building a lot of beginner sets right now, um, so there's, there's definite reason for me to have a stockpile of grips and cut a bunch of grips at once so that I've got just a bunch in the uh, workshop to work with. Um, plus, I actually enjoy the process. I think it's kind of fun. Um, and I'll show you in a little bit how I go about doing this. Um, I'm also going to show you what a whole hide or a whole yeah a whole hide looks like compared to a side, so that you can kind of get an idea and, and I'll give you an estimate of what I think I'm going to be able to get out of that you know both of those a side and a whole hide uh, as far as quantity of grips. Um, so yeah, but before we move on, since we're upstairs here, I just want to show you that I'm not the only one in the Hickory Hacker household that's got a uh, collecting itch. This is my wife's collection of Olympia typewriters. Uh, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. These are the nicer ones that are on display. Uh, so yeah, just wanted to, to point out that uh, I'm not the only one taking up a lot of space with cool vintage things in the house. All right, so I'm down on the floor here. Uh, I wanted to run through what I've got in mind for this leather. Um, and by that, I mean, I've got specific clubs that I wanna use some of this leather on, and I wanted to explain that rationale. So. Let's start with the clubs that are, you know, I date about 1910 and earlier into the gutty era. Um, I like to use suede for those grips. This is just a standard brown suede, and I've got a gray suede here. Uh, the rationale for that is when I find authentic clubs from that era, I often find bulkier, um, kind of russet colored uh, suede grips on those clubs. And uh, the suede is nice because you can build up a bulkier grip without um, too much trouble. And because the clubs are so heavy from that era, you can have a really nice bulky grip on a gutty club with suede uh, without negatively affecting the swing weight too much. Um, so it's kind of a twofold reason. Part of it is to try to make the new grip look as close to an authentic grip as possible. I'm not trying to fool anyone, I'm just trying to stay true to the nature of the uh, the way the club was originally made. Um, so I'll use this for my pre-1900 gutty clubs. And then I kind of figured I would, um, you know, give the color, a, you know, a little bit more of an update, but still stay to the suede grip uh, on the clubs that are dated 1905 and up to 1915. Um, again, because I see that a lot on authentic uh, irons from that era. Um, so that explains the suede. Um, the other bit of premium leather I've got here is uh, some vintage deer skin. And as you can see, this is very supple, soft leather compared to the rigidity of this, um, this leather here. Uh, and my idea for this is premium putter grips. I think it'd be cool to have a nice soft leather. I mean, I'll probably, while I like suede side out on most of my grips, I'll probably use the pebble grain side out on uh, the premium putter grips. Uh, and that actually brings to mind another reason why um, I'm using this leather for something as limited as just putter grips. Um, I could probably cut, oh, I'd say 15 to 20 grips out of this particular piece of vintage leather. Um, but when I compare the ease of cutting a grip out of this leather to something that's more rigid like this, this is a pain to cut that many grips out of. Um, you know, I'll eventually do that over time, but when I want to do a bunch of grips at once for a big project, like I've got a lot of beginner sets right now that I need grips for, this is much easier leather to work with and cut 40 grips out of at one sitting because of the rigidity. It doesn't slip on the board when I'm using the rotary cutter, and this will slip all over the place. So it's just gonna take more time to cut these grips. So I'm probably only gonna cut maybe five at a time, something like that. And because I'm using it for premium putter grips, I've only got a couple cut putters in mind right now that I need those kinds of grips for. So I'm not in much of a need of quantity out of these kinds of grips. And the suede is a similar story. I've only got a limited number of gutty clubs that I need grips for right now. And uh, I've got a set of 1908 to 1912 kind of transitional irons, um, smooth face and some early scoring patterns that uh, I'll use this particular leather for, but that's only like four or five clubs. 
So I only need to cut a few bricks out of this, these softer, more uh, supple leathers today, which is nice because, like I said, when you're trying to cut quantity, you want to have a more rigid leather to work with uh, so that it doesn't slip around on the board. So that takes us to these right here. Um, I've got five different colors here. This is a navy. I don't think that's going to show up too well on the camera because it looks black right now. But that's navy. We've got the tan here. We've got the darker tan or brown. This is black and then obviously red. Um, this is all basically going to be for the post-1915 uh, hickory clubs that I build, um, the beginner sets. Uh, at a certain point, I'll have all of these cut and I'll be able to give the customer uh, a choice of what they want, what color do they want. Uh, all of these are, uh, they say they're all about three to three and a half ounces uh, in weight. I think they're actually less than that. Um, I would say that these are probably more like two and a half to three, which is ideal. Um, what I've found is that I like having a thinner grip on most of my post-1915 hickory clubs because the swing weights are very close uh, with the authentic grips to being, you know, in the high C's, uh, maybe just up to D0, but as, as, as soon as you take that vintage grip off and put one of these grips on, you're going to be adding weight. They're just heavier. That's just the way it is. So, you know, when you find grips online that are pre-cut, you'll often see that they're about three to three and a half ounces. Um, and that's a nice thick grip that a lot of players like, um, but just be aware when you're putting a grip or one of these new grips on a, a hickory club, it's going to negatively affect the swing weight. So if you have a club like a Niblick, for instance, that's going to be in the high D's, you can get away with putting a thicker grip on it without negatively affecting the swing weight to a point where you noticeably can't feel the head anymore in the swing. Um, but uh, I've gotten used to using thinner grips on my clubs. Um, but when I was using modern clubs, I always had uh, mid-sized grips on them. And um, I just liked having a, a heftier feel in my hand. And uh, I've gotten away with that with hickories because it's more important for me to be able to feel the head weight in my swing. And um, I can do that by, I can both accomplish that and also have a new grip if I use the lighter uh, ounce weight leather. Um, I think this kind of leather is primarily used for uh, upholstery and uh, maybe, you know, handbags, when you want a suppler kind of handbag, something like that. But this is the stuff that's usually the cheapest of Tandy leather, so it's convenient from that perspective. Let's just roll one of these out so you can actually see the size. Um, I think I'm going to do, I'll cut this one today. We'll roll this out and you can kind of see what a side of leather looks like when you buy it. Uh, a couple things that are pretty obvious here, even though you were quoted a square footage of leather, it's going to be oddly cut. So you've got this area here to navigate. Uh, you're going to have some blemishes and holes here and there to work around. So I've got a hole right here. But for the most part, I've got a pretty nice rectangular section of leather to work with right in here. And then you've got this extra that you can, you know, do other projects with. I'm going to have this whole area over here where I could probably cut something pretty large or make something pretty large out of this piece of leather over here. So um, let's talk about length. Generally speaking, I like to aim for my, my grips to be 36 inches. Um, most of the time, I can do that with a larger side of leather, but in this instance, I, as I'm eyeballing this, I'm seeing that 34 inches is probably going to be the ideal because I'll be able to get those, I'll be able to get 34 inch strips all the way down this section, avoiding that hole there, up to right about there. So that's a lot of grips. I'm estimating that'll probably yield 25, maybe 30. Uh, probably about 25 grips, which isn't too bad. Okay, so as I started cutting strips, I discovered a shortcut that's going to make this go even faster that I wanted to point out. Um, at first, for whatever reason, I felt like these needed to be straight all the way across at the top, and they don't. They can go all the way to the live edge, because uh, all that's going to do is give me a longer strip than I originally intended, which isn't a problem at all. 
Um, again, the key is that they don't end up being shorter than 34 inches, but if they're longer than 34 inches, no big deal. So all I really need to do to end up cutting the rest of this side of leather is each time I want to make a new cut, of course, trusting that my previous cut was totally straight from top to bottom. I can trust that this is a straight edge and I just need to measure this up on the rotary mat to the one and a quarter inch mark up here and then carefully make a mark at the bottom of the strip at one inch. Again, not too concerned about if this is a you know, a, a nice straight angled bottom, because I can cut that off too. In fact, I will cut that off. It probably won't even get used on the club itself because it's longer than I need. And then the other trick is if you put, put enough pressure on the rotary cutter and also the ruler at the same time, you don't need to rock back and forth, which is where you start to, uh, you could make a mistake. Um, if you press hard enough the first pass, it'll go through. And as long as you make sure the rotary cutter is both flush against the straight edge and straight above the cut you're trying to make instead of coming in at an angle, everything should go just fine on one pass. And there you go. That's a clean cut all the way through. And I'm going to use scissors to just cut it from the main piece of leather. And there we go, there's another grip. Okay, so just wanted to point out a mistake because you're going to run into them when you're doing this for the first time and after several times, like my situation. Um, I was being a little bit too quick with the rotary cutter and I ended up cutting into the strip that I was trying to, um, that would be end up being the next strip. So that's disappointing because what I have to do right now is kind of start a new straight line because if I just cut this part off, then I might get myself all out of whack down the line. So I'm just gonna go ahead and basically write off this part of the leather and start a new strip but this is just uh, an illustration of why it's important to take your time with this, even if you find a, a pretty efficient way to, um, to cut these. You know, it, it can be somewhat tedious, but uh, put some music on. Just take your time, enjoy it. Um, you know, it, it's a pretty good feeling when you use this right and you get a really nice clean cut the first time and you look at the grip afterward and everything's really nice and crisp. Uh, it's worth taking your time on. Okay, so it's been about an hour and a half of cutting, and this is what I've got left. And uh, I think this is a good stopping point, because um, I've got some other ideas for a piece of leather this size. Uh, but you'll remember I was aiming to get 25 grips out of this side of leather, and I ended up getting 40 grips. So way more than I expected, and I attribute that to the efficient... Uh, way of cutting these. I didn't actually have much waste, first of all. Uh, this is just, you know, a couple sections where I made a mistake or I had some extra uh, width that I didn't need. This is the area where I had the hole, and I did make that same mistake that I showed you earlier where I wasn't, you know, taking my time. Uh, so that kind of messed up my straight edge there, but it was close enough to the hole that I just figured I'd make it a little larger and cut that off. But I only lost probably one grip there. I could probably get another three or four grips out of this section of, you know, 34 inches length. But uh, I want to save this the way it is because I have some ideas to make some pouches, uh, you know, to hold tees and sand tee molds and things like that for a gutty golf set. Uh, that'll be a future workshop video that I'll show you. Um, but yeah, I mean, for a $50 side to, to get 40 grips, my price per grip there is pretty low. Uh, when you consider it usually costs about five or six dollars per grip um, through other outlets. So um, if you are, if you do only need one or two grips or, you know, less than five or ten even, 
Uh, Hickory Golf Workshop is definitely the spot to go to for that because they have a lot of great variety of uh, leather. Um, they, I think they have elk, bison. Um, so they've got a good variety of, of quality leather. Uh, Gary knows what he's doing, cutting these grips. He's been doing it for a while. So yeah, if you need individual grips, definitely hit up Hickory Golf Workshop for those. Uh, but if you have a lot of clubs that you're trying to process or you're building sets with um, and you need more than probably 10 grips, you know, a bulk leather buy like this is, is probably uh, the way to go. Um, so yeah, that's that. Uh, you know, about an hour and a half worth of work and I got 40 grips out of it. So can't complain. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that I also bought a whole hide, and I just wanted to lay that out so you could see the uh, comparison in size to the sides, which um, obviously would be half of one of these. Um, it's not always right down the middle, like you would expect maybe uh, one side to be on over there, cut through the middle here, but as I lay this out, it's probably more like here, down and maybe not even at a straight line, kind of like a diagonal a little bit, uh, if you wanted to have equal sides or equal amounts of leather on each side. But um, yeah, based on what I was able to yield from the side of leather that I just worked with, I would expect I could get probably 90, maybe even 100 grips out of just what you're looking at right here. So this side actually costs 50 bucks. Uh, I'm sorry, this whole hide costs 50 bucks. This is one of uh, Tandy Leather's holiday specials. Um, I'm not sure it shows up on the camera very well. My partner Dinah here is in the way. But this is kind of a uh, uh, silver sheen kind of uh, pebble grain on the smooth side. And then as you see here on the suede side, it's kind of a slate blue, uh, light navy. Uh, I think this is going to look really sharp uh, as a grip, and um, yeah, pretty excited to you know score a piece of leather this large uh, when I'm pretty confident I can get quite a few grips out of it. All right, we are in the workshop, and what you see in front of you here is the Hagen driving iron that I've showed you in some previous videos. This is the club that I've decided to do the experiment on with the uh, splice extension. And uh, if you remember from last time, I didn't have a bench vise installed on my workbench. And I was trying to figure out what the easiest way would be to attach one. Uh, I tried a, um, an, a, basically a plank of oak and tried to extend my workbench that way and mount it on that. That didn't work. Then one, you know, after about two hours of screwing around with it, I was like, why don't I just drill it straight into uh, the workbench itself? So it's one of those things where I could have saved myself some time if I had just looked for the simplest solution. But this is working great. And this is super sturdy. It's doing everything it needs to do. Uh, and then what you see here is the jig that I mentioned was going to be necessary so that it would give me something to actually plane against um, kind of a hard surface and uh, well before I forget just want to remind everybody that the book I'm using for this project is Bob Kuntz's Antique Golf Club's book. Um, you can still find this pretty easy on eBay every once in a while uh, but he gives the instructions on how to make this jig. This is basically a two by two uh, piece of pine and uh, these little things are pretty neat. So I've got it clamped by uh, basically I, I drilled uh, a block off, or I, I'm sorry, I sawed a block off and then drilled a hole, five eighths inch hole through this, uh, through the block and then just cut the block in half in order to produce two halves of these clamps. And then I used a file to kind of widen it so that it would be, um, you know, wide enough to accept the, the butt end of a shaft. But um, these are working great. So then you use some C clamps or these clamps to attach this to the uh, the jig that you're using, and uh, this isn't going anywhere. I mean, I can really go to town on filing that, and you can see that there's a fair bit of progress I've made now that I've got this all set up. It's still kind of a labor-intensive process, and maybe there's a quicker way to do it that I haven't figured out yet, but uh, when we get into this project in two weeks, I'll show you how I go about doing it, 
And with all these projects, what my hope is, is that somebody else will try it and then say to me, hey, I figured out a shortcut to something that you did that saves time or is just a better way to do it. That's great. That's the point of doing these videos. So um, I'm going to bring the camera a little closer so you can see, see some of the details here. Yeah, there's not a whole lot more to show you other than just a different angle of this. So, I mean, super simple jig to hold on to the shaft. And then you can see that gave me enough of a sturdy uh, base to really go to town with the file and the rasps and creating that, that angle. Um, I'll get into what I did wrong with this particular shaft when we talk about the project, but I think I'm gonna be able to salvage it uh, despite my mistakes. So, yeah, so that's that. I'm gonna take this jig off and then I'm gonna put the camera up in the cradle uh, for the next part of this video. Okay, so here's the last part of this week's Workshop Wednesday video. What you see here are all of the grips that I cut upstairs, rolled up and put away in their proper storage unit. <laughs> uh, I like keeping things organized just because when I'm in a hurry or I'm you know, just trying to find stuff in the workshop, it's nice to know that everything's in one place and properly organized. So um, I've got actually I got another one in my pocket here. This is the one I was going to use. So this is one of the ones that I cut earlier. Um, like I said, I had 40 grips. I think I actually, when I counted them after rolling them, I was only, uh, I was at 38. So, sorry, I was too short of 40, but uh, that's still pretty good. Um, I actually had a 39th one, but it was kind of, you know, weird at the bottom, uh, weird cut, so I didn't include that as part of it. But um, anyway, I thought I would install this grip onto a golf club that I uh, am getting ready for my store, which I haven't mentioned yet in this video, but uh, I've made a lot of progress on the online store. And uh, right now I seem to be on target to have it ready for a uh, launch in early January. Uh, and again, what this is, is the hickoryhacker.com. Uh, it's a new website uh, that is centered on the, uh, the store that I'm building, the online store where I'll be able to sell individual clubs and also make it easier for people to order beginner sets from me. Um, but anyway, I uh, needed a lot of extra grips here for the clubs that I'm putting in that store and will plan on selling and I'm plant that I'm planning on selling. So uh, I'm going to grab one of those clubs here in a second and let's put this grip on. Okay, so this is the club that I'm going to put the grip on. This is a, a pretty interesting club, actually, um, and you'll be able to find this in my online store uh, in probably middle of January. But this is a Gibson made Smith model anti shank mid iron. Uh, these are uh, interesting clubs to say the least. Um, I used this in the course vlog of East Hartford Golf Course that's called uh, Banned and Patented Clubs. Um, if you watch that course vlog, I used this a couple times and I didn't have great luck with it except for the very first swing I used with it, um, if I remember right. Um, I got great contact on that one really good swing, but the rest of them, I just dug the leading edge really easy. Um, I think I could get more comfortable with this club if I used it more often, but um, it, it's really not for me. It doesn't really fit into any of my play sets very well. Um, spec wise, it's pretty good though. 24 degrees and D zero swing weight when it's got a grip installed. And um, yeah, we'll actually, we'll check that in a second here to see how this new grip affects the swing weight. Uh, but it's a rustless iron and it's a Gibson. Uh, also, these Smith model, um, I don't know if that shows up very well, but these Smith model clubs uh, are hard to find and pretty collectible whether or not you played it or not. So um, anyway, this is the club we're going to use today. Uh, let's do a quick check of swing weight before we've put a grip on and just see where we're at. So we expect it to be more than D0 because we don't have a grip on right now. And it looks like it's settling out. I'm going to say we're going to go with D3. It's pretty close to D3. As you can see here, 
The taper is pretty apparent. We've got about an inch and a quarter up here, tapering down to one inch down here. I want this to be a suede side out grip. So I want this to be the, the playing side, uh, which means that this first cut is going to be on the pebble grain side. This is the side that's going to be, you know, tacked down to the club. And you want to do this angled cut, it's usually about four inches, but this is so that you can start winding it around the club easily. And I just make this, try to make it as straight as possible. Uh, leave a little bit of room at the top there so you can have some space for the tack. And then, this is kind of a balancing act sometimes, but wrap that on there. Oh, by the way, the club is resting in the cradle toe side down. Just that's the natural way it sits in here. But I like working on the back end of the club so that the tacks are behind your, your hands and really not in the way. Um, I had a tack. Now I lost it. These things are so small. That's the key, actually. <laughs> you you want to make sure you're using tacks that are this small, if that shows up very well. Um, you can find tacks that are larger than these more readily, but they have a tendency to split the wood when you hammer it into the butt end here. So uh, Hickory Golf Workshop sells the appropriate size tacks, and I definitely recommend you just buy them from them because I haven't found another source for them. I've heard that um, like uh, Hobby Railroad folks have tacks this small, but I haven't gone into one of their shops to see uh, if they compare, uh, if, if they're the same size or not. So I just buy them from Hickory Golf Workshop in a, in a bulk order of other things and it works out well. All right, so we're gonna tack this in, or hammer this tack in. I like to make sure that's as flush as it can be. Now you'll notice that your angled cut here is gonna allow the, shaft, or the, the grip to wrap nicely around the shaft. So this takes a little bit of practice. I like holding it in my hand like I am here instead of resting it on the, uh, the cradle to do this part. And you can be as particular with this as you want. I don't mind having a little bit of a rib section between, sec you know, between wraps, but some people like this to be as flush as it can be so that there is no rib whatsoever. Uh, that's all fine and dandy, <laughs> but I know that a lot of times my cuts to make these grips aren't going to be as straight as necessary in order to have these lines. Now, I am curious because I feel like the, the strips cut pretty well this time, and I'm just curious if this is close to being straight. It's close, but it's still, you know, there's still, you'd have to overlap this in order to cover up the friction tape in certain areas. So... Basically, I'm just going to kind of leave a little bit of a rib, but I'm going to get as close to the line of each wrap as possible so that, you know, those rat, those ribs are minimal. And I'm stretching this as I go as well. So, again, this may not look as pleasing to your eye as a completely straight, no, no rib um, wrap. This is as good as I can do it. You know, this is the best I can do. But I've also learned that I kind of like this because if I wanted to choke up on playing this club, I kind of use these ribs as guides. And, um, you know, they don't bother me. Um, you know, maybe they'll bother you, but um, they haven't bothered me yet. And uh, I can get along with this just fine the way it is. So uh, this is the way that I wrap them. Trying to... Keep this as tight as possible. What you saw here is the end of the friction tape. And this is where we're gonna basically cut this grip off. So I got some leather scissors here. I'm gonna find that edge of the friction tape and I'm gonna make a cut. If this stops spinning. I don't know why it's spinning. It must be resting on something weird. All right, so I made that little cut there and I'm just gonna make this straight across at this point, creating another little flag, basically, that'll be tacked into the shaft. We're close, there we go. I didn't grab a tack before I did this. Oh, looks like there's one on the... That's an old one. Let's see if that one works. If it's still sharp, it should. 
Sometimes, like I said, um, this is an old tack and sometimes you can reuse these if they're still straight. Yeah, look at that. All right, so we saved ourselves a tack. Look at that nap on the suede. That That's gonna be really nice in my opinion. Um, I'm pretty, pretty happy with these grips or with the leather that's making these grips. So yeah, that'll be nice. Okay, so now we're getting into the aesthetic part of the grip. I like using a knife and what I'll do is basically just cut at an angle into the bottom of the leather here. I'm gonna work all the way around the club. And what I'm doing here is trying to create a taper for the winding to climb up so that it isn't an abrupt kind of, um, you know, situation where the, the whipping is, is, you know what I'm saying, where the, I want to have a nice taper for the whipping to climb up the grip. I'm going to try to clean this up as much as I can. This is the first time I've used this leather, so um, I like the nap on it, but it, it is a little bit uh, messier here on the bottom. It doesn't cut as clean as I'd like, or my knife's not as sharp as it needs to be. That's quite possible. So I'm going to try to make this as clean as I can so that there isn't any of these little tufts of suede popping through the whipping. You see there the gap, you've got a little bit of a, a gap that's been created by my moving around, but you can just adjust the grip again. And once you put the whipping on there, it's going to keep that tight. Let's get into whipping options here. I think that red would look pretty sharp on this one. Uh, those of you who have bought clubs from me in the past uh, know that I like to use red grips and um, black thread, black whipping thread. Uh, I'm going to change that up. You know, I, um, you saw all the different options of leather that I will eventually have in, in grips. So um, I don't think it'll be probably until the spring, I'm guessing, that I'll offer the option of uh, grip color. But um, when we do, if you order something from me that doesn't have a grip on it already, um, then I'll, I'll ask you what color grip you want and then uh, try to find a complementary thread as well for you. Um, let's put this on the whipping stand. And this process is pretty self-explanatory. Um, the uh, the one thing I'll mention here is this can get frustrating sometimes if your whipping keeps slipping when you're trying to wrap it on. Um, I don't really have a real good tip for that. Some people like to take a small piece of friction tape and put it under where they're going to be wrapping the whipping so that it has something to grab to. Uh, but I, you know, I tried that. I I figured it was just better to try to be patient and try to, you know, get these first couple strands on, um, you know, wrapped. And then after you get about two or three, then you can really start to tighten everything down. And uh, that's what I did here and it's working fine. Kind of keep that up there. So what I like to do is keep this excess on here until I get up to the tack. So. This is what I was talking about earlier. You got a couple little pieces of suede popping through the uh, in between the whipping thread. That bugs me a little bit, but uh, it'll it'll wear itself off once you start playing with it. So now I'm starting to cover up the tack, and uh, this is a good spot to cut off the excess here. And then I'm going to do two or three more windings before I put in the other piece of whipping thread in order to make the loop. I'm taking careful, uh, or I'm taking my time in this area because I want to make sure that the whipping thread secures this part of the grip 
that was kind of popping loose earlier. All right, so that's a good spot to do the loop. I used to have a thread puller that, again, I got from Hickory Golf Workshop, but I broke it. So uh, this is the old way to do it. This is a thicker piece of, of waxed thread. I've got a whole spool of this here. Um, I've used this on some gutty clubs because it's not too far off the gauge of the whipping thread that I use for my gutty clubs. A lot thicker than the whipping I use on other hickories. But uh, yeah, I'll cut a, a piece of this off and that's all you got. Just that and you make a loop and put it under there and then I'll give this probably another five or six windings. Making sure I'm tight, trying to stay close to the previous wrap. And uh, we'll do one more here. That's pretty good. You want to be careful not to do too many lines before you try to pull it back through because if you've done this really tight, that's not going to, it, it's not going to come through very easy. Um, all right. So now we want to cut off the main, from the main spool. You got this little bit here. You're going to feed that through the loop. You're going to make sure that this part's tight without screwing up the rest of your grip here. And then you just use two fingers here to pull this through or third finger if you have to. There you go. And then you got that part there that you just cut off and that's that. Um, one last piece of whip, whoops, one last piece of uh, whipping here is necessary at the end of the grip. This kind of serves the same purpose as down here where it just keeps everything from getting loose. But honestly, if you put that tack on there right, you don't have to worry about this coming undone. Mostly this is an aesthetic thing on this end, I think. And I'm only going to do... Well, first I'm going to make sure I'm not running this into anything else. Okay. Um, I'm just going to do probably three windings with this before I cut the excess. Come on. All right, there we go. Get my loop, and I'm going to put this on here right away and just do another three windings before I pull it back through. It might have just been two. I don't know, but that's that's as many as I want. All right. Feed that through there. Tighten it up a little bit. And there you go. And you can kind of adjust that after the fact. Put the access off and you are good to go. Okay, so with the grip on here, let's check the swing weight and see how much we changed it. Remember, before we put the grip on, we we're at D3. Let me step out of the way. So we're at D3. We're not there anymore. We're about right on D0. So. Didn't really change much at all from the grip that was on there before, uh, but um, that should work. That'll do it for this Workshop Wednesday. Hope you got something out of it. Uh, I'm really enjoying putting these together. I appreciate the feedback everybody's been giving me on them. Um, and uh, as always, encourage you to ask more questions so that I have more to talk about. Uh, put it in the comments below. Send me an email. Find me on Instagram, at Hickory Hacker. Um, and uh, yeah, just let's keep the conversation going. I'm hoping the live stream will be able to work again uh, after the new year sometime. I've got some plans for boosting the Wi-Fi down here, but I haven't done that yet. And I'm going to just keep doing them this way because I think it's working pretty well. Um, but yeah, I want to wish everyone a happy holidays. And uh, if, if you're looking for a last minute gift idea, definitely check out stewardjacoby.com. Use promo code HickoryHacker21 for 10% off your purchase. And uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks. Thanks. Bye.